<laughs> I'm finding that out. <laughs> All right. So um, I want to uh, I want to introduce uh, Chief John Austin from the New Haven Fire Department and uh, very progressive chief, uh, very modest. So I'm going to. Uh, so I'm not going to embarrass him by going into all his, uh, all his credentials and everything, but he, uh, Chief Austin, Austin came out of uh, Jersey City and was the Chief of Special Operations, which is very apropos for tonight's presentation, which is um, Mayday, Mayday, Bayday, and, and Mayday and Rapid Intervention Teams. And uh, and I got I got to tell you, you know, he I, he's. The keynote at the FDIC, he, uh, he is one of the best. Pre yeah, and I'm not, yeah. I know he's modest and he's going to he's not going to be, be happy with me saying this, but yeah, you, know, you keep it up. I'm going to leave. How about that? <laughs> but I go back to the days of Alan Brunacini and uh, mm -hmm. and Carl Holmes and uh, and Tom Brennan. And you know, I today's today's Tom Brennan's and today's Alan Brunacini is uh, people like Chief Austin, who uh, is one of the most respected people in our field, and uh, and we're really lucky to have him here tonight and uh, doing a, a very important presentation. And Chief, I'm gonna uh, what I'm gonna do, and everybody, uh, when the presentation started, if you can mute your mics, that would be uh, that would be helpful. And, uh, and what I'm going to do, Chief, is I'm going to turn the host over to you. Yeah, because I, I can't use the screen yet. So you will be in control here. Make host. Yeah. Okay. I just. And welcome, Chief. I just saw the light. All right. Let's just hope it's not an oncoming train. How's that? <laughs> We've seen that? those before, haven't we? Yes, sir. Or right. can everyone see that screen? Yes, we can. Say, calling the Mayday yep. Rapid Intervention Crew. Yes, we can. Yes. Right. Everybody I'm else set. can see it. Yep. All good. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And you can hear me clearly. Yes. Absolutely. I, I know. I know the New Haven firefighters don't want to, but uh, let's just <laughs> let's just roll with it. Uh, first, I want to thank the Connecticut Fire Department Instructors Association. Uh, mostly in the person of Chief Bonomi. Uh, I was very fortunate. He mentioned a couple of my mentors, uh, Dr. Carl Holmes. I got to be on the program a couple of times with Alan Brunancini, became a friend. Uh, he even befriended my son when he came on the job. Uh, I miss those guys. Um, they had such a wealth of knowledge. They gave so much, but they took a whole lot with them. And so we're just trying to recover those uh, golden nuggets. Um, I did practice this earlier and the video was lagging. So I'm not going to play the videos. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to do mostly, I don't want to do death by PowerPoint. You know, you put the slide up and I read it to you and we just keep zipping through it. I'm using the IFSTA Firefighter 1 um, size up Mayday and RIT because I wanted to make sure it was common ground for us in the, in the state of Connecticut. And as I talk about the state of Connecticut, I just want to thank the folks that have welcomed me and my family, not only to New Haven, but to the state, uh, the instructor cadre, uh, Jeff Morissette, Bill Higgins up at the academy uh, have been tremendous. Uh, Doc, we miss you, man. This, I'm waiting for this COVID thing to get, get gone. Got two new pumpers I'm putting out on the street next week and I need your lens. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate no that. Doc is the uh, fire historian for the New Haven Fire Department. So what I'm going to try and do, uh, I saw uh, Lieutenant McGovern, uh, who is a very, very excellent officer in the city of New Haven. Uh, LT, when I hit one hour, if I hit one hour, uh, you get to cut me off. All right. So hopefully. Uh, we'll, that. Thank you, sir. We'll get to the point where... Um, I want to cover those three areas, awareness, uh, Mayday, and uh, RIT, and then uh, we'll talk about some examples, and I'll give you some resources as well. Um, I appreciate the fact that you you, you all have allowed me to uh, present. Um, for those I've never met before, uh, my name is John Alston. I've been in the business, and it is a business, uh, 35 years. 
Uh, I'm the chief of the New Haven Fire Department for four plus years now, but I did 31 years in the Jersey City Fire Department and I moved from the rank of firefighter to the number two position there. Uh, I always say my favorite positions there, favorite assignments was company officer, battalion, and special ops chief. I like that because you still had the hands-on and I noticed some of the chiefs that are in the room, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, as you move up, you got more headaches and less hands-on and a little more distance between you, the job and the members. But it does not mean that you're disconnected. And so what we're gonna be talking about tonight, I hope will not only help the firefighter who's crawling down that hallway or cutting that roof or performing that primary and secondary search, it will also help the battalion chiefs, the officers, the things that we need to look for. Um, I did special operations in Jersey City, did 10 years in heavy rescue, did re respond to 9-11 uh, where I lost a, a number of friends and mentors and instructors that I taught side by side with, that I learned from. And the only thing I can do to honor them is to share what they shared with me. There is nothing new under the sun. The equipment may change. Some of the tactics may morph into something else, but as Dr. Burt Clark, and I'll talk about his book later, he says, we're still fighting fires in some places the same way that Ben Franklin did. Close, wet, fast, and hot. And unfortunately, we are still losing our members to poor decisions or lack of information and lack of communication. Even though the equipment has gotten better, even though our ensemble has become better, for the most part, we are still losing folks. And we're gonna be talking about that too. And for a while, I was a master instructor for the IAFF. And of course, I missed <clears throat> training with those folks as well. I learned as much as I hope I shared with them. We're gonna talk about the prepared firefighter, a prepared firefighter. Because when we start, start to think about the mayday, think about this, a mayday is a situation where life is in danger. Uh, in fact, the, the, may, the word mayday is a French word for life threatened or life at, 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 a, at a loss. Uh, it's, it's higher than an SOS. It is, I'm here, I'm trapped, I'm stuck, I may lose my life, come rescue me. So the mayday has a priority. But the best type of rescue ever is to not be in a position to call the mayday in the first place. We want our firefighters to be prepared. We want them to be properly trained, properly outfitted, part of a team, have an assignment, have accountability, have air, water, and communications. And that's gonna be our theme throughout the night. Making sure they have what they need, making sure that situational awareness and an ongoing size up, an ongoing size up is part of this. That is going to keep or prevent us from being in a position to call the mayday. Now I'm gonna talk about the fire service culture in a little bit too, because when you talk about the fire service culture, we can have well-prepared firefighters that still find themselves in these different positions who are trapped or stuck. And you know what happens many times because of the culture? Uh, Ken Dermody, if you could mute your mic. Uh, maybe I can do it for you. Yep, bingo, it's good to be the chief. If we get our firefighters to have the situational awareness and they still find themselves in those positions of being trapped, disoriented, or lost, we don't want them to have the mindset that I'm not going to call for the mayday. And that's part of our fire service culture too. I'm not going to be the one to say that I'm in trouble. I'm not going to be the one to be embarrassed. I'm not going to be the butt of the jokes around the firehouse kitchen. I'm not gonna be the one to call for help. I'm gonna figure this out on my own. And we're gonna talk about that as well. Firefighters must be prepared before entering any area immediately dangerous to life and health. And that means making sure all of your equipment is checked out. It's your responsibility. It's not just the driver of the apparatus. It's not just the officer to check the SCBAs. It's not just the dispatch that's going to check as well. You, mean, you need to know that all of your equipment is intact. It is functioning properly before you enter an IDLH environment. You would be surprised at the number of line of duty death reports, and we'll talk about them later too, that we read 
that firefighters were going in with less than their full capacity of air. They would go back to the log and find out they hadn't checked the cylinder for two days. These are things that are completely in our control. So it's not just making sure that we're prepared mentally, but should we find ourselves in trouble, we wanna make sure that we have all the equipment and resources that we need. We wanna give ourselves a chance to survive. When does size up begin? It actually begins upon the receipt of the alarm and then continues and may change <coughs> on your assignment. So depending on where you are and what you're doing, your size up becomes different. There's an old, old story about uh, three blind men who come across an elephant and they are asked to describe what the elephant is. And so the first one walking in the front touches the tusks feels the points and he says, I believe it's a warrior with a spear because I feel something sharp and pointy. The other one standing beside him was feeling someplace else. He says, I'm a firefighter. I feel this thing right here. That's gotta be a hose. Well, the other fellow found himself around the Charlie side and he started slapping where he was. And he says, I feel a wall. And they told him to move out of the way because the, the whole lot of you know what's gonna come out of that wall. Depending on where you are, what you see, what you feel, what you touch is going to change your perspective. We know that when we're in a fire, when we're inside of a fire, visibility is limited, sounds are muffled, multiple sounds are happening at one time, radios are going off, apparatus is arriving with their sirens on. And one of the things, and I, and I, I am very proud of the New Haven fire officers, they knew one of my pet peeves when I first got here was having an SCBA pass alarm going off in the street unattached to a firefighter. And I know when we come out of a fire, we take our packs off, we're exhausted, we're, 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 we're literally wasted, we just wanna get that thing off. But you think about it, if we're not addressing that pass alarm that's going off, that's unattached to a firefighter, if, we're not, if we start to get comfortable with that sound, if that sound keeps us from hearing someone inside of a fire who activated their pass alarm, it is a dangerous thing. And I'm grateful that the firefighters and officers in New Haven picked up on it. I actually hear them at boxes sometimes. When someone's going off, I'll hear them. Whose bottle is that? Shut it down. And I greatly appreciate that. We should never be comfortable with that sound. But when we talk about size up, if you're the writ officer, your size up is different. If you're the first arriving officer, your size up is different. If you're the arriving chief, battalion, deputy, or other, your size up is different. And so we wanna make sure when size up begins, everyone, everyone utilizes the information that they have. Size up is a matter of safety for all personnel. We wanna know what's happening, what happened, what is happening, and what's going to happen. In other words, when I talk to my officers, I always ask them, what do you have? What are you doing about it? And do you need help? If you can give that information to any commander or any officer or supervisor or boss on the scene, then we're all operating from the same information. What do I have? What am I doing about it? And do I need help? When we use situational awareness at all times, all firefighters must be situa situationally aware. I got that out. So what ends up happening, it begins at arrival and continues with communication. Everyone monitoring that radio, everyone on that fire ground now begins to share the same information. Now, based on our SOGs, our SOPs, our particular piece of equipment that we're riding, the tools that we carry, everyone's got a job to do. Everyone at a fire is fighting that fire. And so with situational awareness, we wanna make sure that you use your senses after entering a structure to increase your situational awareness. It's everything. It's not only watching for the color of the smoke, we're watching for density, volume, and where it's emanating from, because that's going to tell us what type of fuel it is, whether we've gotten to the seat of the fire or not, or, whether conditioning conditions are worsening at, to the degree that we may have rollover, flashover, or backdraft. We wanna listen for sounds that are indicating whether the fire is being knocked down or whether it's becoming more intense. 
We want to feel the wall with the back of our hand. We say that all the time in Firefighter One. I can tell you the numbers of times that folks have not done that. I look at some of the injury reports and I know that they did not do that. And you want to check for sounds on the floor when you're advancing. All of these things go to situational awareness, go to size up, and will prevent us possibly from getting in too deep, too far, or to a place where we cannot be recovered. Because when we talk about some of these line of duty deaths in the, in, in the past, when you read the report, you would be amazed at some of the simple things. It's almost what we call the domino effect. There were four or five things that led to this firefighter's death. If you had removed one of the dominoes, I used to watch those people on TV all the time. They put the thousands of dominoes up. And while they were setting up and practicing, maybe they accidentally hit one. They immediately grabbed two of the dominoes out of the way ahead of the ones that were falling so that they would not have that chain reaction that would complete the entire fall of all of the dominoes. Our survivability is no different. If you look at every one of the firefighter injuries, serious injuries and deaths, to a fault, there was always something that could have been prevented. There was some indicator that it was going to get worse or it was worse than what they thought. And if someone had swiped those dominoes away, if someone had pulled them back, if someone had given them a message about a, a crack in a wall, uh, a, a collapsing or creaking floor, uh, lack of water runoff from a building, then, or switching from defensive, from offensive to defensive, many of those different dominoes, if they were removed, we would know. Your information comes from a lot of places. Witnesses can provide several pieces of information. They can tell you whether everyone is out of the building. They can tell you whether it's occupied or not occupied. They can uh, actually tell you what's inside the building. Because when we talk about our full size up, that 13 point size up, when we talk about occupancy, occupancy is not only how many people are in there, occupancy is use and contents. Is it commercial? Does it have hazardous materials in there? Are there renovations going on? Are there missing floors? Are there voids? Are there uneven uh, stairs with no rails? Witnesses can be the greatest piece of information that you can have. So as we move with fire and attack and ventilation, we expect if it's done correctly and coordinated, that survivability conditions and improved visibility is going to happen. It is better for uh, the victims that we're attempting to rescue, but it also makes it safer for our firefighters. You know how fast you advance through a structure when you can see and you have visibility and moderate heat. And when it's extremely hot and no visibility, you can't see your hand in front of your face. The operation is completely different. The time sequence is completely different. And the longer you take to get to the seat of the fire and the longer you take to get coordinated ventilation, and that's not just cutting a hole, it's knocking in that ceiling and making sure you report what you're getting out of that roof vent. All of that goes to survivability and making conditions better for us. So the decision of when to begin search procedures is always based on fire control and location and search while advancing a hose line. We search for life and we assess fire conditions as we go. John Norman, uh, another friend of mine who says, vent, enter, and search. When you're vent in, venting, entering, and search, it depends on the structure. We're learning a whole lot about flow path now. Uh, Slicer RS is another acronym that's out there. Uh, we kind of know that we need to control doors as we open. We understand what fire growth is about now. We also understand when we're making it better or making it worse. Your situational awareness and size up based on construction, location and extent of the fire, the fuel load, and what you're attempting to get done will dictate how fast you move, where you move in the structure, and whether you switch from offensive to defensive. Remember, the lives of all of our firefighters depend on these survival skills that we're talking about. They must learn to recognize and avoid potential hazards. They must rescue lost and trapped firefighters and escape unavoidable hazards. Sometimes it's happening in real time. You're losing a stairwell. Think about where you are, situational awareness. How am I gonna get out? Has the RIT team thrown up ladders? Have they softened the structure? 
has the accountability officer recognized where I am? Did I give a real-time report when I moved from one division to another division? Now, as I go through this presentation, if you have questions, I want you to type them in the chat window and hopefully we'll get to them. If we don't get to them, I know we're recording and I know that Chief Bonomi, you'll be saving the chat log. Uh, I'll be more than happy to respond to them and we can push it out through the group. Prevention-based survival is the most important survival technique. In other words, I want you to read the fire and anticipate development. When you, when you, when you get into reading fire, if you learn how to read smoke and you understand building construction, those are the two things that will increase your level of awareness on fire attack, survivability, but also there's a book out and it, Dave Dotson did it a long time ago, The Art of Reading Smoke. I was fascinated with that because in The Art of Reading Smoke, it not only talks about color, density, volume, and velocity, but it also teaches you how to read the fuel load and the location of the fire. In other words, you will know whether you're making progress or not making progress. So we will anticipate development, anticipate location and extent of the fire, identify the construction type and potential collapse. Um, when I was teaching classes on uh, uh, first line supervisors, what do you need to know about building construction? Everyone that I know and up until a few years ago was reading the Brannigan book. Phenomenal book a lot of information. I didn't have enough time to process all that information on arrival. Particularly, I want to know as an officer going in or as a chief sending personnel in, I want to know what that building's made of. I want to know how it's going to burn, how it's going to fall down, how fire and smoke are going to move through it. How do I get in and how do I get people out? A good writ officer will recognize those five things. How is it gonna burn? How is it gonna fall down? How is fire and smoke gonna move through it? How do I get in and how do I get people out? That should be part of your size up and locate entry and alternative exits. We always wanna know a secondary means of egress. When we perform prevention-based survival as well, we perform what's called risk benefit analysis. In other words, we need to know what are we doing in this building? Are we trying to save a life? Are we trying to save property? Or have we gotten to the point where the risk, the benefit has lessened and the risk has increased? Then we need to start thinking tactically about a marginal attack and change our strategy from offensive to offensive defensive, offensive cautious, defensive, and or we surround and move to the exposures. So you wanna anticipate interior changes and exterior changes. You wanna check on your own and, and your, your own and your team's air supply. We already know about the two in and two out that we have. And there are also uh, recommendations under the consensus standard of the NFPA 1710 that talks about the different situations that we're responding to. Because again, if we start talking about RIT teams and, and, and rapid intervention crews or fast teams as they, know, as they know where I come from, what is the compliment when I have mutual aid? If I'm working with a Metro city department, what they determine a rapid intervention crew to be and my neighboring mutual aid from a volunteer company, what their rapid intervention crew will be comprised of and what will it be comprised of at the time of the alarm or when it's assembled is going to make a difference as well. So in your pre-planning and your SOGs, make sure that when you identify what a rapid intervention team is, all of your neighbors know what a rapid intervention team is, not just in the complement of people, but also the equipment cache that's gonna be there as well. I want you to follow these other important guidelines before and, and during interior operations. Just consider the current and projected fire behavior and structure and anticipate. Always have a backup plan. Remember the following guidelines when practicing survival preparation as well. Know how to survive hazardous situations. In other words, if a ceiling came down and it's a suspended ceiling, possibly with fluorescent lights and wires that you may be entangled in. Do you know how to reduce profile and rotate yourself so that your tank stays in place 
and that now instead of being face down with your tank on the back and wires on, on and connecting you and you can't move, being able to take one arm off, loosening your belt and roll over on the ground so that you can face your hazard and be able to reach into your pocket and take out your wire cutters and free yourself. If you don't know how to do that, you need to practice that. There's several videos on YouTube that know how to do it. Look, I'm a lot bigger than I was when I was at rescue in 2000, 1994 and 2004. Every now and then I still practice rotating through my Scott because I still never know whether I may have to go into a building. And if you are going to be prepared to do that, especially particularly officers, that is a drill that you can practice with your folks just by using some bungee cords or some tension hooks. You should be able to be, be able to practice that right in the firehouse with a chair, a door, drop a bungee cord over their tank and see if they're able to rotate the tank and extricate themselves. Know how basic firefighting skills are also essential. In other words, sometimes you can shut down the line until you get closer to the fire. Don't open on smoke. You're gonna decrease your visibility you're going to cool the smoke, it's going to lose its buoyancy, and it's going to make it tougher for you to get to the seat of the fire. It's going to make it tougher for the survivability of your victims. And God forbid, if you become tra trapped, it's going to be tougher for us to find you. Use situational awareness, as I said before, and be aware of your surroundings. Now, you can do everything right. You can still get stuck. When they train fighter pilots, they spend so much money training fire fighter pilots they have to set up these parameters. And the parameters are, if your fuel is lost, your engine fails, you lose control, or you drop below the canopy of 10,000 feet with a fighter jet, you need to eject. The problem was they trained these fire, fighter pilots to such a degree of expertise that they felt they could get out of any situation and they were crashing with these billion dollar planes. Believe it or not, the money that goes into the experience and the training going into the mind of a pilot is more important, more valuable than the plane itself. So what are their drills? They teach them over and over again, loss of fuel, loss of elevation, loss of control, fall below the, the uh, ceiling of 10,000 feet, you eject. And they train them that way over and over and over again. The reason for that is many pilots in the past, because they survived a situation and they remembered how they did it before and it was a successful outcome, they said, you know what? I'm gonna keep fighting till the bitter end. Well, my friends and family, firefighters do the same thing. Firefighters will fight to the bitter end. Firefighters will believe that this situation is just like I, it happened the last time, and all I've got to do is X, Y, and Z. And sometimes, and many times, they're wrong. Gordon Graham talks about that. Dr. Gordon Graham, he calls it recognition prime decision making. In other words, you had a bad situation, you got out of it, you had a bad situation, you got out of it, and you think that the same techniques that got you out this time are gonna get you out the next time. And so you continue to try and work your way out of that trapped situation until it's too late. You don't call the mayday because you're embarrassed. You don't call because you can figure out how to get out and now it's too late and now it's gonna take us longer to get to you. Recognition prime decision-making is real. I can tell you that it's real because how many times have you driven to work or any place that you're familiar with and you get upset when they block the road? You actually get upset when they block the road. They block the road because the road is dangerous. It may be missing. There may be a tree down. There may be an accident. But you know what? I drive this road all the time. I can't believe they want me to go a different way. Ladies and gentlemen, that is recognition prime decision making. We become frustrated because we're comfortable going the way that we know that we always go. And so I hate when I hear someone say, oh, we had a routine job last night. We had a bread and butter job last night. You might have used the same techniques, but no fire is the same. None of them. 
I'll get off that high horse. Recognizing the Mayday situations is a vital firefighter survival technique. Entanglement, air emergencies, lost or disoriented, or falling through floors are the most common. There are thermal emergencies. They could be a rollover, flashover, backdraft. You could become trapped with a, with a floor collapse or an entanglement, as we said before. Gordon Graham talked about recognition prime decision-making. The immediate communication increases the chance of survival. In other words, when you're lost or disoriented, call for help. It doesn't matter that you think that you can get out of it. If you can get out of it, great. What do we say all the time? Transmit the second alarm. Well, we don't transmit the second alarms. You don't want the chief to show up. We always say, if you don't need them, you can send them back. The same principles apply for Mayday. If you become disoriented, separated, fall, trapped, disoriented, you call for the Mayday. You can always cancel the Mayday, but get the help coming to you right away while they can, while it's still survivable for you. And it is safer for them to make that. Give your location and remain in place. If in immediate danger, transmit the Mayday. Transmit the Mayday. We've started something in the city of New Haven where we, uh, we practice the Mayday uh, protocol uh, at every radio test in the morning and at night. Some of you have heard it. I get a lot of pushback. Uh, you wouldn't believe the pushback I get. Uh, that's training. And uh, we're only supposed to do night training X number of times in a year. It's not training. It's a protocol. Think about it. You are practicing the verbiage, the language, so that it becomes second nature for you to tell us that you're in trouble, how you're in trouble, and the best way for us to help. And I've got one that'll blow your mind. Our dispatchers are learning the language. They're learning the verbiage. And they're learning the ways that they can assist us. Because how many times have you been on the fire ground and someone transmitted something and the dispatchers heard it and you didn't hear it on the fire ground for whatever reason? It happens. I was in, I was in Plainfield, New Jersey, where I lived, uh, lived a long time, 30, 30 miles from Jersey City. And I heard a firefighter transmit a mayday on the third floor of a building and no one on the fire ground heard him. I heard him at home with my scanner. And I called dispatch and I said, as you acknowledge the mayday and they acknowledge the mayday, it happens. So the more people that understand what's going on, it increases our situational awareness. It increases our survivability. When you transmit the mayday, there's information that we need from you. We use the acronym LUNAR. The acronym LUNAR stands for location, unit, name, assignment, resources needed and situation. But we also ask you, if you can, with that information, attempt self-rescue. Remember, you're the best person to understand your situation if you're not unconscious. So there may be some things that you can do. And we're gonna talk about that, taking advantage of a mayday and how to check for windows and making sure that they're good windows and alike. Take the following actions whenever a mayday is broadcast. Make sure that there's mayday radio traffic only. And at the end, I think what we can do, um, I have a sheet that I, I, I've been working with for years. Um, I'll attempt to put it up where we can all share it. If not, uh, Chief Bonomi, I'll, I'll send it to you if you can get it out to the group. Uh, it's actually a tactical worksheet on one side, but the other side is strictly handling a mayday. And the reason why we wanted that, that to happen, I don't want the incident commander to try to manage the mayday. You cannot manage the fire and the mayday at the same time. It does not work. So either you as the IC are gonna take over the mayday or you're gonna and assign the fire to someone else, or you're gonna to continue to work the fire and you're gonna assign the mayday to someone else. You may not have a re heavy rescue company. You may not have a writ officer at the time. I hope you do, but whomever you can assign that to, there are specific steps that they need to do to resolve that mayday and then report back to command that the mayday has been resolved and cleared. Number two, radio channel allocated for the mayday. And there's some discussion on whether you should switch channels or not. I always want our members to switch, the operation to switch to another channel. I don't want that firefighter to have to think about switching channels. They already transmitted on that. Move the operation to another channel and let the RIT team or the rescue work on communicating directly with that firefighter and extricating them. 
Three, non-essential activities cease and search begins. In other words, you shut down any lines that are not controlling the fire. You quiet any equipment that is not being effective. You make sure that your radio channels are clear. And again, you make sure that none of those pass alarms that are unattended sitting outside on the street are sounding off that you couldn't hear that firefighter on the inside activate their pass alarm. And then you either dispatch or you make sure that the RIT team is activated. And we're going to talk about the RIT team too. Listen closely to the radio transmissions being made. You may be able to assist a downed firefighter nearby just from verbal, verbal uh, um, uh, signals or be able to hear them communicate with them in the building. They may be just down the hall. They may be just in the next room. They may be the floor above you. Follow orders and do not freelance. I'm gonna show you, a, I'm gonna try and show the video through my camera uh, of a, a Mayday video firefighter rescue situation we had in Jersey City during uh, Hurricane Sandy. It was the third day in. We had a firefighter fall from the roof, three stories, and everyone wanted to go and assist. You'll see, we look like ants, everyone trying to get into this alley, alley to get to this firefighter even putting their lines down that were controlling the fire. We literally had to order them back to fight the fire. Everyone can't affect the rescue. So no freelancing. The IC may order personnel to exit, and you'll see that in the video clip as well, if we can get it to roll. And you must recognize department evacuation signals, i.e. Um, the transmission over the radio, but also it may be air horns. Depending on what your department uses, you have to listen for those and you have to obey them. Proper air management allows firefighters to exit IDLH's area, IDLH areas safely. Key principles, make sure you know how much is left. I like for you to check your air three times during your shift. You never know from the first time that you turned it on that you turned it back off and it went off completely. You don't know if there's air trapped in the regulator to give you a misreading. You don't know if there's a leak if you changed your, changed your cylinder uh, during your shift. Check your bottle three times. Inform the IC if you must exit the building. There's accountability that has to take place as well. And know the point of no return. In other words, if it took you 12 to 15 minutes to get to the seat of the fire and you're just starting to knock it down, guess how much air you have. In the standard bottle, in the standard bottle, and I'm not talking about a firefighter who is fit and who's not fit, because you'd be surprised. You'd be some, see some firefighters who you wouldn't think were fit at all, who are better at air manager, at air management than some of our uh, iron pumpers, as we say. Know the point of no return, because at the most maximum output, we're going to get 22 minutes out of that bottle. 22 minutes. They used to have the two bottle rule, but some places you still have the two bottle rule. You go through two bottles, you come out. Well, NFPA standards have changed. The, the standards have changed to the degree of how much reserve air you have in your pack determines when the alarm goes off. And so if you're using an old pack or a new pack or you've moved to the new pack, you have to make those adjustments. Don't stay in longer than you have to. Now, sorry about that. Check your gauge regularly and know your point of no return. Individual firefighters can decide to leave only under special conditions. And if they're separated, if only if they're separated or a catastrophic event, but you have to notify your officers. The worst thing an officer can tell me is that they lost or got separated from a firefighter. When we do a PAR, a personnel accountability report or roll call, and you don't know where all your members are. Worst. I'm just telling you, that's the worst thing that you can walk up and tell us. You don't know where your members are. Or you may exit as a team. And that could be done by the division supervisor recommending someone to go out. Or you know that one member of your team has run out of air and you all want to come out. Knowing how to react in an air and emergency, air emergency is essential. Don't panic. When you get the Viber alert, and now that the NFPA standard has changed, the Viber alert is going to go off earlier you still have a significant amount of air reserved, but calmly notify that you're coming out for air and you're working your way out. I can tell you the number of times I hear as a chief, someone giving a report and I can hear their Viber alert going off. And I look at the deputy, why aren't they moving? Why aren't they on their way out? Get another team ready because you don't wanna take a chance on running out of air. You don't know the fire's not under control yet. 
They may discover something else. There may be a gas leak. There may be any kind of situation where you're going to need that air and you're still inside the building. And there are several different techniques. Air management, I want you to check your regulator regularly. Duh. Uh, inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Believe it or not, you will save more air by doing that as opposed to the panting method when you're doing this. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Pause or skip a breath. And I need you to practice this as well. One of the reasons you wanna pause or skip a breath, it actually slows your breathing down, but it also quiets you so that you can hear other firefighters in your vicinity who may be talking muffled, or there may be radio transmissions that you need to hear, or there may be something outside of the building that you need to hear. If you're constantly breathing in and out, it becomes a rhythm and you cannot hear what's going on for you. So situational awareness, skip a breath, pause a breath, but then you're able to listen and you slow your breathing down. And again, check your SCBA three times if you can. To survive a May Day event, monitor your surroundings and use situational awareness. Choose a course of action. You're either gonna remain in place and you're gonna tell us that, you're gonna seek safe shelter, you're gonna tell us that, or you're gonna to attempt to escape and you're gonna tell us that. All of that, all of that is part of your survival. We want you to stay calm, breathe slowly, stay low, communicate with the radio, activate your pass alarm when we tell you to, tap on the floor, make noise, shine your light directly overhead, um, tap on a pipe if you're near pipes, temporarily turn off your pass alarm to listen and activate it again because Again, we want to make sure that you're utilizing every communication tool you have available to you. And if you're activating your pass alarm intermittently, then you don't have to talk and you're saving air. Seeking safe shelter means taking action to improve the situation or buying time for escape. Stay low. Close doors behind you. Sure building materials with tools. Filter toxic air with protective hoods as a last resort. In the old days, and I know there's some folks in here that know the old days, when we ran out of air with that old 2.2 uh, uh, or the 2A, Scott, we disconnected that regulator on our chest and we stuck it inside our coat. And we, there you go, Diane, we stayed low to the ground. It works. I cannot tell you the number of times I see firefighters walking upright in an IDLH. Escape is the best survival option when, you, when you're in a mayday situation. If there's an imminent threat of, of a collapse, no safe shelter, air supply is exhausted, extreme fire conditions, conditions are imminent. In other words, you see that glow, you feel that rush of air, and you see the vapors or the fingers rolling over your head. If you have not received an order to abandon the structure, you can abandon the structure. Get on the radio and say, we're on our way out. Conditions deteriorating. Conditions are worsening. It's untenable. Get out. Escape requires teamwork and practice. All right. You need to know about the male coupling and the female coupling and know that the male coupling is on the way out. You can practice this as officers and teams on your drill night. What you can do is go right out into the apparatus floor, charge a hose line, hook it around a few things, hook it around a pole, hook it around a, a desk. Uh, have your members suit up, turn their mask around so they can't see and have them, you can activate a pass alarm anywhere in, in where that hose is. They have to go find the uh, pass alarm and they have to exit. It's a perfect drill. And then the next time you do it, you have an active firefighter or a mannequin that they have to remove because we're going to talk about that too. It takes a lot to remove a firefighter from a structure. I don't care who you think you are. Uh, there are two cases. One was Brett Tarver in, in Phoenix. Brett Tarver was 6'4", uh, physically fit. Um, he got trapped, activated his pass alarm, did everything that he was supposed to do. The first RIT team could not find him or locate them. They ran out of air. They sent a second RIT team in to try and locate him. They located him, but attempted to remove him, ran out of air, trying to package him up to get him out. It took a third RIT team to go in and get him. So think about those types of things. Follow these general safety guidelines when escaping a structure. Stay calm, maintain control of the nozzle, use points of reference, and stay low. Again, also, keep contact with the wall. 
stay in radio contact. Remember which level of the structure you're on. Uh, the the uh, fire in Pittsburgh, the size up that they gave, they gave a three story in the front of the building, a four story in the back of the building. And when one of the crews fell through the floor, they thought they were in the basement. When they went to search for them, they were into the building from the other side. They thought they were in the basement. So making sure that you identify the structure that you're on and performing a 360 when you're the writ officer in the IC, or if you have an aid, if you don't have an aid, attempt a multi-sided view of the building so that you can determine whether there are two stories in the front and four in the back or vice versa. Follow these steps to search for an exit. Locate the wall and crawl. Sweep the floor with your hand. This is slow, slow. You don't know if you're at the top of a stairwell. You don't know if what you're touching is not a window. I remember uh, being in one time and it was time to get out. It was really, really hot. And I turned to my partner at the time was Michael Essie. I said, we got to get the, you know what, out of here. And he took his hook, he turned around and he saw what he thought was a window, took the hook, took out the window and I went to follow him. It turned out to be a china closet. Now you wanna talk about a pucker factor? It was heating up. We were trying to get out and what we thought was a window was a china closet. I want you to take your time, determine if the window allows for at a exit, it may not. There may be bars on the window. And so we'll talk about the RIT team as well. The RIT team, your job is not only to perform your own size up, the location of the fire, location and extent of the fire, where crews are operating, how do you get in? How do you get them out? But also we need you to soften the structure. Softening the structure means if you see fortified bars, you remove them. If under the direction of the incident commander, you can, you turn every window into a door. If you have a deep seated fire and they've already vented windows, something that the RIT team can do is remove that window sash, remove that center bar, make every window a door and throw ladders up, multiple ladders. Now, we talk about multiple ladders. Sometimes you may have multiple RIT teams. If it's a large one-story commercial structure with multiple entry points, you're gonna need multiple RIT teams. If you're in a high rise, you may need multiple RIT teams, one to go with your search and evacuation post, the other one to be on the operational floor Standing by, sort of if crews need assistance, they're going to be able, you're going to be able to move quickly and notify command and ask about conditions. One sad story that I have, uh, Captain Dave Holcomb was at the One Meridian Plaza fire uh, in Philadelphia. He and his team lost their lives. I was so impressed with him and I was so grateful to know him in my lifetime. He was the ultimate professional officer. One thing that did not come out in all of the reports was when they were trapped and they were running out of air, he got on the radio and he requested permission from command to take the window on the upper floor. What kind of mind is that to know that if I take this window, I'm either gonna make it worse or God forbid shards of glass are gonna fall from an elevated area and harm firefighters below. He was running out of air, but had the mind to say, look, before I do this, he requested permission from command based on the conditions and whether they could take it, take the window. Sometimes we can make things worse or we can make things better. But again, have that mindset to think about the whole act that you're gonna do. If you're on the ground floor, it's real easy. Take the window, step out feet first. Even if you're a little elevated, you can hang drop and get out. But if you're on an elevated floor, you need to know that those ladders are in place. You also need to know that the aerial has been placed and that the aerial has not moved, especially if you entered with the uh, aerial or you entered with a ground ladder, make sure no one moves them. Once you place them, you leave them in place unless fire conditions dictate that you have to move. If they do, you notify everyone. If not, report your location and the need for egress. Now, I'm not going to dive into escape ropes. Um, I've tested quite a few of them. Uh, I'm not going to endorse any one product or tell a fire department or a firefighter which one you should wear. Uh, it's based on your department guidelines. It's, to base, it's also based on whether you, your department allows you to do it. You may not be allowed to do it. But I can tell you this. If you buy a system, you need to know it inside out. 
and you need to practice with it. Reaching a wall, we call that the swim technique. If you look at the uh, second uh, picture, uh, many times if you are trapped and you've called your mayday and you believe that you're stuck, what you can do is let them know, I, I'm attempting to go through, go to a wall or breach a wall. You may be able to get into another apartment or even into the hallway or from the hallway into another apartment where it might be a, a safer harbor for you. Again, we talked about the wires and being able to disentangle yourself. So one of the questions I'm gonna ask you, and you can throw some answers in the chat room because I've been talking a long time. How does a firefighter decide on the best survival action to take if a May Day event does occur? How do you make that decision? Calling the May Day. The longer you take to call the May Day, the more difficult the rescue and extrication become. Two stories I want you to look up are the Phoenix Fire Department, Brett Tarver. Those are the videos I had to play for you, but they weren't playing through it. And the Charleston Fire, the Super Sofa Store. The Super Sofa Store, nine firefighters lost their lives. They treated it as a routine fire. It was a, it was a dumpster in the back of this one-story class two building. It was a sofa store. It started in the, um, in the uh, dumpster. They pulled a single line. Uh, to knock that fire out. What they were not aware of is that the fire had already gotten into the hanging ceiling and it started burning insulation. And so when it dropped down behind them, it dropped down behind them, they became trapped. They had the one line off and um, you can look up the story. It, it actually uh, got worse and we, we lost nine of, our, nine of our folks there. When we talk about rapid intervention teams and rapid intervention crews, and I'm mindful of the time, LT, Give me about 15 minutes after, after uh, we'll, we'll get there. When we talk about them, we want to make sure that we're practicing what we preach. When we talk about NFPA 1500, when we talk about two in and two out and rapid intervention, again, as I stated before, we want our teams properly outfitted, part of, properly outfitted, part of a team, have an assignment, right? So that there's no freelancing. Do not underestimate the time and personnel required to rescue a downed firefighter. Carrying one unconscious firefighter can require four rescuers and fully removing the firefighter from the hazard zone can require up to 12 rescuers. This process can take as long as 20 minutes to complete. Think about your air, think about your resources, think about your entry points, think about your exit and extrication point. Mandatory equipment for the writ. We always say you have to have water, a hose line, radio, and the ability to extricate that firefighter. Many times I'll see these tarps set out with all different types of equipment. You need to set that out every time. You need to be prepared. You don't know if that first company going in all of a sudden loses the floor or loses water or becomes trapped. You need to be ready to act. And so the RIT team is important. It's not just being able to size up the building, but knowing the techniques of how to remove a, a firefighter. When a mayday is transmitted, establish radio contact. It de depends on your department's SOGs and SOPs on how you're going to actually do that. I'm gonna share the sequence that I've done uh, generically and with the New Haven Fire Department. Digital radio transceivers can help locate uh, disoriented firefighters. You can use that, but you can also use feedback. You can key your mic, and that's why we want you to stay on the same uh, channel as the downed firefighter because if you're searching for them and you're nearby and if you key your mic, their mic will come on and then you will get some type of feedback. The new digital systems, it reduces feedback. So you have to be close enough to that firefighter to hear your voice or hear your noises come out of their radio as well. After locating a downed firefighter, take the following actions. Check their air supply immediately. Deactivate their pass device so that you can hear yourselves clearly and confirm their identity. Because I have been at scenes where multiple uh, maydays have been transmitted at the same time. You wanna make sure that you're operating at the same, uh, on the same uh, frequency and that you know who you're going after. And so the accountability officer and the accountability rings on your rigs are important. When, uh, whenever um, you set up your command post, you should have some type of accountability system so that you know who's who and who's doing what. Rick and Rit uh, then notifies command of the location and the status of the downed firefighter. They request assistance if necessary. 
They mitigate hazards. In other words, they make the situation better. They may have to assist with venting, entering, and searching. They may have to assist with getting a hose line in place and place it between the firefighter or utilize the firefighter's hose if that's what they had in place to knock down the fire while others are packaging them up for removal. And sometimes you'll have to move to a safe shelter if necessary. In other words, you may not be able to get that Stokes basket in where you need to. It may remain in the hallway. You may not be able to get it to that lower floor. If conditions are worsening, it is more important that you move that firefighter to a safe harbor or safe shelter, then package them up to move. Or if you can't, you find a safe place for you to bunker down and wait for assistance to come for you as well. Exiting the IDLH area usually takes priority over stabilizing injuries, which we just talked about. Make sure the SCBA is functioning or remove the firefighter from the hazardous atmosphere. Now, many of us have these RIT kits where we actually are bringing in air. We now can connect uh, an additional uh, supplemental air supply to our firefighter. But again, if you're not removing their uh, tank, that weight is going to increase. There are also techniques that you can practice while removing a firefighter, converting their harness, I'm, I'm sorry, their SCBA to a harness and utilizing the SCBA as a drag uh, strap or a lifting strap to get them out. There's several drills that you can practice. Removal of a firefighter from an elevated window, removing a firefighter from below grade. There's the Denver drill. There are some breach drills that you can do. There are reduced profiles. They're switching out tanks. There's several different things. They're all on YouTube that you can practice with your crews. Warning, never remove your face piece. This is not the movies. Never remove your face piece or compromise the proper operation of your SCBA to share your air supply, not even with another firefighter. There have been times that firefighters took their mask off to help another firefighter, sucked in superheated gases and collapsed themselves. And now we have to rescue two firefighters. It's almost like riding on the airplane. What do they tell you? If you remember riding on an airplane, before you assist anyone, even a child, put the mask on yourself and then assist someone else. One of the few questions, when does a rapid intervention crew or team begin work on an incident scene? When do they begin it? We'll look for that in the chat. I talked about, um, uh, uh, Dr. Burt Clark, Dr. Burt Clark is a brilliant, brilliant uh, gentleman I met at the New, uh, the, uh, New Haven Fire Academy, the <laughs> National Fire Academy. And Dr. Clark wrote this book, I Can't Save You, But I'll Die Trying, The American Fire Culture. I think you ought to pick it up. It's a great, great resource. The other resources I want you to take a look at are uh, Firefighter Close Calls, uh, Billy Goldfeder, um, phenomenal gentleman. He had the secret list. The secret list, believe it or not, was out so that firefighters could anonymously report near misses. We could, we could share information about how we almost died at a fire so that we could learn and share and grow with other firefighters so we wouldn't have to repeat the same mistakes. I say it all the time. Most of our SOGs, most of our building codes, most of our equipment, most of our tactics strategies and our policies and procedures, we learned from members and the public who died. We need to learn from every one of those lessons so that they did not die in vain. Uh, Fire Officer Trust is a blog I run. I've been real busy with COVID. We're gonna push some other stuff back up there. I would challenge any officer to go on cdc.gov, the NIOSH fire, and read the line of duty death reports. Not, be, not to be morbid, but to understand that someone died and in that report, in that investigation, not to assign blame, but to look at the commonalities that we run into all the time. We see these things in our fires all the time. The difference is we went home and those others didn't. And as an officer, it's your responsibility to learn stuff like that. It is your responsibility to send your crew home the next day or at the end of their tour better or the same than when they walked in and met you. Uh, FEMA and the National Fire Academy have that uh, have a website for training as well. There's a lot of free online training there. IAFF.org has a lot of peer support training, rapid intervention crew training, confined space training. The NFPA has all of the standards, and I have a leadership uh, 
uh, website that I run to help empower leadership uh, um, in, in officers, to provide real efficacy for you, to teach you uh, command uh, presence, if you will, and there's several ways we do that. We do it through a nonprofit organization. I do not draw a salary from it. All I do is charge you enough to print materials and to utilize it to teach other firefighters what others taught me. And with that, I'm just going to take Q&A if we've got uh, some time. Let's get this out of there. And Chief, uh, John and Miller, uh, Chief John and Miller uh, was asking about radio frequency uh, of... Uh, switching frequencies. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to uh, bring up your question? What's the frequencies? What's the frequency, Kenneth? I'm sorry. What were you saying? I, yeah, I just, I, I've heard a lot of different discussion on this. And the, the latest I've heard is some departments are looking to not switch any channels at all, to have radio discipline, but realizing that adjacent crews are more likely statistically to to save a down firefighter than the RIT team or get to them first and to have them as part of the response on the same frequency. Got you. So there's several, uh, great question. There are several schools of thought. Uh, they go both ways. It depends on the complement of your department, the size of your department, how many people you have operating in the building at that time. Many times, believe it or not, as we said before, switching the frequency gets folks back to fighting an active fire scene. You don't want anyone to cut a person off if that was the last transmission that they were gonna do. Depending on the number of people that you have in the building though, there may be someone who can hear that person audibly without the assistance of the radio. The other piece, depending on what radio system that you're using, if it's digital, there are some templates out there that do not allow for radio bleed. In other words, uh, the, the deputy chief's radio could cut out the battalion chief's radio. The battalion chief's radio can get priority over the captain. The captain can get priority over the lieutenant and the lieutenant can get priority over the firefighter and the chief and dispatch have priority over the others. I have actually listened to some of these things where the firefighters first on the scene were reporting that they were in trouble. And unfortunately the chief was outside on the radio saying that we've got a Fire showing in a one, two, three, you know, he's talking over them. We know with the analogs that they, they can bleed through and you can hear. It depends on your department, the structure of your department, what you feel is best. If you have a full complement and your, your personnel are comfortable staying on the same frequency and you know that you can maintain radio discipline, super. What I've heard in some of these is that I'll hear someone saying that they're, they're requesting entire more ventilation or they're saying what they've got and completely interrupt that firefighter who feels that no one is listening to them. And God forbid if they decide to change channels on their own. So it goes both ways. It is, it is knowing your firefighters, knowing your radio system and knowing their comfort level as well. If they understand complete radio discipline, got no problem staying on there. And there are some departments that don't have multiple radio channels. So they have to stay on that. All they have is dispatch and fire ground at the same time. So it depends on your complement. Absolutely great question. The, uh, one of the, I see we have uh, Chief, Chief Bill Seward from, uh, who was a training officer in New Haven. And, absolutely. And um, you know, uh, one of the fires you mentioned was the Pittsburgh Jim Crawford. Mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, after, after that fire, his, his crew was lost. Uh, um, at every building, team is building specific. It's type of building specific. And, uh, and Jim would always do the RIT training around the country with his Winnebago and his team. And, uh, and I know my good friend, Charlie Hershaft, the chief in Guilford would, would do uh, RIT training with Jim Crawford's Pittsburgh team every year. If you want, if you want to, uh, if you guys pin my video, pin my camera, it'll, it'll enlarge that for you. And you will see that was the four alarm fire that happened. Um, it was a fire three days into Hurricane Sandy. Everyone was on generators. There was a propane generator feeding the building on the right and a gasoline generator filling the one on the left. And when they restored power, it backfed into one of the generators. It exploded and sprayed the side of those two buildings with gasoline, and they were asphalt shingles. What do we call asphalt shingles? Gasoline shingles. 
And so on arrival, they had a large amount of fire in two buildings. Believe it or not, the fire on the, the, the building furthest to the right was the original fire building. So we had fire on the Bravo, Bravo 1, Bravo 2, Bravo 3. In this actual clip, and I hope it's not lagging, it's going to get a little closer, you will see that a firefighter falls from the roof onto the, onto the ground, three stories from uh, exposure B2. And you will see this mad rush of people once they transmitted the mayday. This, you'll see stretchers coming from everywhere. Everyone was trying to get into that alley to get at that firefighter. And uh, Chief Miller, to go back to your point, radio discipline was lost. It was absolutely lost. There were folks that were inside of the building that we had sounded the evacuation who never heard it. And there were folks on the radio screaming that a firefighter had fallen down from the roof. We knew a firefighter full, fell from the roof. We saw it. And so as you look, everyone's trying to get into that alley. And you will see the, uh, the uh, battalions and assistant chiefs, we're wearing our civilian clothes because we were in the EOC when we responded to the fire. That white helmet to the right is the chief of department. Well, he was actually uh, there running the fire. We had to tell people, go back to fighting the fire. Remember we said, you gotta make the situation better. People were coming, we sounded the evacuation. Some folks got the evacuation tone, others didn't. Uh, so then we had an issue of having to send a runner into a building that was almost fully involved to tell firefighters to get out and some of those firefighters were cut off. So uh, yeah, it, it depends on the size of your department. It depends on the situation, on whether you need to switch channels. That was one of those instances where we would switch to another channel. Because- Chief Olson, just to let you know, that's the hour mark. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're too kind. You're eight minutes sh shy, aren't you? <laughs> I'll say it to you this way, LT, you like engine four? <laughs> come on chief i know you do you're doing a good job there you know uh, chief uh, the, the importance of uh the importance of uh sounding a mayday early you know uh when business was a deputy chief in hartford and he used to say you know get ugly early you know get he heavy hose streams and same thing with a mayday i mean you're putting your RIT team at risk uh you know if you meet any of that criteria, sound that May Day early. Uh, in Absolutely. Yeah. So you want you want experienced officers and and you want competent officers. And let's face it, in the fire service, our officers are not getting the full fire experience because building construction, all right, education, uh, notification systems, so early alarm systems. So we're not getting those fires, those knock down, drag them out, going from one uh, building to another. But when we are getting them, many of them are very unique. Um, their, their location and extent of the fire, uh, selection of hose lines, um, uh, fire growth, something that we are continuing, continuing to learn about, fire growth and path. What is actually happening to that building once we go into it? Because even if it's a vacant building, it's now occupied because we're in there. Depending on what door or window that you open, you're changing the fire conditions. You're changing the reaction of that fuel. And you have to be prepared for that as well. Um, you, you said Chief uh, Seward had a, a comment or question. Chief, go right ahead. Hey, I, I was uh, commenting about uh, Jim Crawford coming in. Oh, I got you. I got you. And, uh, yeah, that was the Bloy Street fire. Yeah. And I knew a couple of Pittsburgh firefighters that responded to that as well. That was, uh, that was something else. We had the Hackensack uh, fire in, uh, in Jersey City, the Ford, uh, I'm sorry, in Hackensack, where uh, five firefighters were trapped inside of a, a commercial uh, auto showroom. Um, we just have to be situationally aware. All right. Anybody else uh, have any uh, comments or questions? We got a, we got a wealth of... Uh fire service uh, skill and talent out there in this Zoom window. Um, you know, Chief uh, Chief wrote up about uh, uh, Dave Dobson, and uh, he always used the term about angry smoke. Yeah, correct. Uh, 
smoke that's going to light up and, uh, you know, that pre flashover type smoke. And, yeah, I used to say turbulent voluminous, Turb turbulent volume, voluminous. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking into the uh, chat to see if there are any questions. Okay, moving to another channel. We have uh, teams on the outside. Absolutely. The RIT team, the RIT officer has a very unique uh, perspective of the, of the fire. They have to perform a 360. They have to monitor the radio. They have to look at the accountability board. They have to communicate with the, with the chief so that they understand what operations and assignments are, are going on. Then they have to look at that building and see if it's, it's effective, what's going on. They have to look for entry and exit points. How are they going to get some people out? How are they going to soften the structure and throw ladders up? You are not there to stand by and watch the fire. And a lot of folks say, oh, you shouldn't engage the RIT team. They're going to get tired. If they're getting tired throwing up two ladders, I need a new RIT team. You need to put some ladders up. You need to soften the structure. Uh, if it's lighting, if it's whatever. Um, I'm not asking you to go to full work. Uh, it may be that I want you to bring three links to the front of the building and leave it there for possible deployment. Uh, but making sure that RIT officer, and you have to trust your RIT crew too, that they know what they're doing. And that only comes from practice. It falls on the first line supervisor, whether you're in charge of a truck or whether you're in charge of an engine, a rescue or squad, it, it falls on you to know what the rapid intervention team or crew is supposed to do. And you need to practice it. Um, in my old department, every Saturday, whatever Saturday we worked, we worked on Mayday, RIT, and firefighter extrication. And we would take a, one of our firefighters and put them in the basement, steal stairs, and we would extricate one of our own because we needed to make sure that everyone knew the communication, language, channel, and picking that dead load up, literally. Got to practice it. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Steve. And the, uh, and the important thing about, uh, you know, if I'm 304 into the basement, um, use the term Mayday. Uh, yes. Because that incident commander doesn't, doesn't know what 304 is in the basement means. Um, you know, that it's not a Mayday uh, event. So Mayday is a really important term and uh, mm -hmm. it should get everybody's attention on the fire scene. We have, uh, yes, uh, I heard from a f couple of folks, the, the Mayday procedure we're using over the radio. Absolutely. Uh, Chief, I'll get that to you and or to the secretary. I found it fascinating. I got pushback on it. Oh, we don't want to do that. I said, so what you're telling me is you don't want to know what to say if you or one of your members are trapped and lost, right? Well, it's not that, Chief. Well, what is it? I said, well, I'll tell you what. Whether you want to or not, I want you to know, <laughs> okay? I want you to know what to say and what to do. And some of them have actually taken to it. I, I hear some of them are actually putting their uh, SCBA on and practicing using that, using their remote mic uh, with it to make sure that their communication is clear. And I applaud them for it because when panic mode sets in and that radio mic drops down into your coat, and you have to open the top of your coat to, or under your coat and try to get to it. And all heck is heating up your body. The last thing you're going to think about is taking that microphone and placing it against your mask, not your throat, placing it against your mask to transmit the information that we need. Yeah, we'll definitely get that to you. I want to thank you all. I'm going to turn it back over to Chief Bonomi. Uh, really appreciate you on a on a night like this, you could be doing something else. I greatly appreciate you taking some time to listen, Chief, to, uh, listen to an old story. Chief, an excellent presentation. And, uh, you know, the, everything from empowerment to that duties on the outside, uh, you know, I, I always am I'm amazed that if you ever see a Boston working fire scene, I mean, there's ladders everywhere. There's ground ladders, every, every third window, uh, you know, the outside team is uh, is laddering windows, and and you can't have enough ground ladders, uh, you know, on, at a uh, fire scene. But chief, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any else have any questions of the chief or uh... Professor Benomi? I wanted to add a little something, if uh, you don't mind. 
Chair, uh, Professor Brandoli, thank you. Uh, Chief uh, Alston, great job. Um, the only thing I wanted to add was I, first of all, I agreed with everything you said. Um, and going back to the very beginning, you talked about size up. Um, and I agree with you, it begins um, at the time of the alarm. Uh, however, I took it one step further. I've taught all my students who, a lot of them are out there tonight. They probably heard me say many times. Uh, I used to say that size up begins on your way to work at night or in the morning, uh, taking into account the weather. Um, you know, is it snowing out? Is it uh, going to be an icy night? Is it going to uh, turn cold in the middle of the night? Um, are we expecting uh, a, a tornado or, you know, whatever? Uh, but I think uh, I've, I've used that um, uh, through most of my career on the way to work. Just think about what kind of night we're going to have if if we have to go out, if we have to do this, uh, something just to keep in mind. I was typing as you said it. I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> well, thank you. In fact, I got in trouble. Well, not in trouble. I got into an argument with a firefighter one time. I had just gotten to Engine 9. Engine 9 is the busiest engine in Jersey City. I fought to get there, happy to get there. And I was the new officer there. Two of the guys were... One was a 15-year vet. The other one was a 12-year vet. Uh, the other one was an eight-year vet. And the other one was a three-year vet. And the eight and the three-year were bidding into the house the same time I was. And I'm driving in, and there's snow on the ground. And I know Engine 9 goes up and down these hills and stuff. So I get there, and I know the three-year guy is supposed to drive. It's his turn to drive. But I had a company meeting, and I said, look, this is the first time I'm in this house in this district. I know the city. I was born and raised there but I never drove a pumper in this area. So I'm going to pick the guy who's the senior guy to drive. You, you, it's up to either one of you because you know where this rig can go, where it'll get stuck and whatever. The younger guy says, well, you don't know what I can do. You got to give me a chance. It's not today. <laughs> it's just, today's not the day to find out whether you can handle this 32 ton piece of equipment. Today's not the day. And, and I felt bad. He, he took it hard. He, he took it pretty hard. But uh, that's the that's the call that you have to make as an officer. You got to pick your folks that you know can deliver. Not to say that he couldn't deliver, but you have to take your best chances. And when it comes to that writ, you know your crews. You know, you, look, we're in the fire service. Let's tell the truth. You know who's who in the zoo. You know who will get things done, and you know who th who will hesitate, and you know who's still learning. And our job as instructors and leaders are to empower our people to make those tough decisions. It's not a personality or, or popularity contest. It, the, the price is too high. We have to make those decisions. And officers, you put your hand up and said you wanted to be an officer. So make the decision. Thank you, Chief. And um, thank you all for uh, coming on to the Zoom. To it, these mini Zoom uh, sessions, I think, uh, are helpful. Uh, it's uh, everybody zoomed out these days, but this was an outstanding presentation, Chief. And uh, and if you give me all that stuff, I will uh, that information that yeah, uh, I will uh, make sure that everybody uh, that is disseminated to everybody and put on listserv. And uh, and thank you all uh, for attending tonight. And, uh, and uh, excellent presentation, my friend. Thank you. I had one last thing. I'm sorry. Can you see that? This was the checklist that I that I developed and, and brought to New Haven. And basically, our electronic system has this now. But I wanted you to understand that this is the Mayday checklist. I'll make sure that you get this. Thank as you. soon as that happens, you have to switch modes. I'll make sure everybody gets uh, gets a copy of that, and um, and I owe you a lunch now. <laughs> uh, no worries. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Uh, excellent presentation, and uh, and uh, everybody be well, and everybody be safe, and safe holidays. Good holiday, also.